Right. So once again, colleagues, I greet you um, and welcome you to the second, or rather, I would say part two to our discussion for the second assignment in AUI 3702 for semester two, 2022. Right. So now, um, so what we're going to do now, folks, we're going to be proceeding further in with 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 this with the second question but i think before i jump straight into that i'm just going to do a quick recap for you so so that you can see exactly what what happened with question one i know there's a recording that we did on that but i i thought it's a, it, it, it's something that could be very helpful um and useful for you guys especially also looking at the fact that your exam it's 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 actually forthcoming the next in the next month. So you need to really make sure you take note of some of the things that I'll be pointing out for you, which are useful for exam purposes. Now, very important, colleagues. Uh, in question one, they li literally wanted to test you guys on the aspect or the concept with regards to weakness, weaknesses, right? So they wanted you to identify a weakness in the above control procedures. And uh, in the second part of the same question, they wanted you to, re to give recommendations or to recommend improvements to address each of the identified weaknesses. Now, very imperative for one to notice there is to understand what the examiner wants or what the lecturer expects of you um, from this required part of the question. So whenever they're talking of weaknesses, you really need to have an understanding of what is, what is the assumed knowledge which the lecturer is testing here right so the assumed knowledge very important because if you understand the assumed knowledge which the lecturer is testing it makes it easier for you to be able to analyze and have a line of thought approach question accurately very very important so if you know the assumed knowledge which the lecturer is testing on it gives you at least a point of departure to analyze and have the right and appropriate line of thought to answer the question accurately so it's very important so whenever you're talking of weaknesses just i'm just only explaining just the assumed knowledge i'm not addressing the question though because it's something we did in part one of them of the assignment discussion so when they talk of weaknesses or rather when they ask you to identify a weakness you identify a weakness in the case study by looking for two things guys number one you're looking for a case where there is inadequate controls inadequate okay somebody's trying to log in so where there's inadequate controls And secondly, uh, you're looking for missing controls. That's the second part. So whenever they're talking of weaknesses, they're simply referring to these two things. They want to see whether you are able to identify inadequate controls in the system description or in the given case study scenarios. So in other words, we are looking for existing controls in the case study scenario, which are just not being affected accurately or which are just not being done correctly. That's what we call inadequate control. So these are existing controls in the company or rather in the system description of that organization, but these controls are not achieving the intended objective. So the moment the controls are not achieving the, the set objective, it means those controls are considered to be inadequate. Right, And then we would have a case where as you go through the case study scenario, you can frankly see that, okay, um, there is control one, two, three that is missing, which should be in place, which management omitted, all right? But this particular control activity should have been actually uh, put in place by management, right? And when you see a condition like that in the case study, that means we have got a weakness and the, the type or the nature of weakness therein, we call those missing controls. Now I'm gonna open my notes just so that I can quickly summarize that aspect. 
and we get into question two, of course, uh, shortly thereafter. So I've got notes, colleagues, when it comes to how you write weaknesses, notes on how you write audit procedures and stuff like that. So I'm just gonna quickly open my notes uh, dealing with weaknesses, just so that I can help somebody, especially when it comes to, to question one. Because remember, you need to frame the assignment in your own words. So question is, how do you go about doing that? So when it comes to weaknesses, all right, like I said, it's always two conditions or two things that the lecturer is looking for in your weakness statements. So they are looking for a reflection where you are indicating missing controls or inadequate controls. Please don't lose me on this one. So it's those two things that the lecturer is looking for. So for each statement which you are giving as a weakness statement, they want to identify whether you are telling the lecturer that, okay, here, the weakness I'm identifying is it's actually um, representing a case where a control is inadequate, meaning to, so that, meaning to say that control is actually in existence, but it's not achieving the objective. So that way you're saying, okay, that is, the, that is the existing weakness. Now there's a way they want you to also frame or document your weakness statement. I'm gonna explain that to you shortly. Then another condition, of course, as I was explaining earlier, it's a condition where you are, giving a statement of a weakness representing that they are missing controls right so there are different ways in which you have to 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 to, to write uh, or to, to to document your weakness statement in that in that in that manner now let's start with the missing controls part what are those terms what are those phrases that they are looking for which indicates that okay here the controls are not existing when they see words like lack of when they see words like no then you mention the control activity that is not existing. Same thing with non-existent, and you mention the control activity that is non-existent. Let me let me give you guys just a quick example so that you can see how all these things fit in. So when you're writing a weakness, you start your statements by using the following terms. It's either you start by saying inadequate, and the moment you say inadequate, you're simply trying to indicate, of course, to the lecturer that you're saying the control is in existence, but it's just not achieving the purpose, all right? But the moment you begin to use words or phrases like lack of, no, this, non-existing, that, then you're telling the lecturer that, okay, the control activity or the control itself is just not existing at all. So, for example, I can say inadequate safeguarding of assets. So when I say inadequate safeguarding of assets, I'm simply saying that safeguarding of assets as a control is in is in existence in the organization, but it's just not being done correctly. And that's why that control activity is inadequate. Another way, way wording, which uh, if you don't want to use the word inadequate, you can say there is poor safeguarding of assets or there is ineffectiveness safeguarding of assets within the organization. That's another way of still portraying one in the same thing, other than just simply saying inadequate this inadequate that etc and etc so you can use different terms but they need to still go back to the very uh same point where we suggest that okay the control is there but then the issue is it's not being done correctly or it's just simply not achieving their intended purpose but now as you are writing the weakness statement it's not just only about identifying the the control without specif specifying the actual control activity that is either inadequate or that is lacking in the, in the case study scenario. What you also need to do is to get really specific. So if I'm saying inadequate safeguarding of assets, I need to be very precise. Which assets are we referring to that are not being safeguarded correctly? So then I can then begin to uh, become more specific now where I state something like, inadequate safeguarding of stock in the storeroom. So you see it's safeguarding of what? Of assets, but which type of assets are these? That's inventory, that's stock in the storeroom. So you now become more specific with, more, with evidence in the case study scenario, right? Then if it's a lack of a control that is um, a, a weakness in the scenario, then you use terms like this, lack of independent checks of stock count, lack of independent checks of stock count. So I, I don't just simply end by saying lack of independent checks. 
I need to, to be precise. Which checks am I referring to that is not being executed? Which independent checks or independent review that is not being executed? So you, be, you, you, you become very specific by adding more evidence as provided in the case study scenario, guys. All right? And you can even expound further, all right, by even putting more details now. Don't lose me on this part. Remember here we indicated the control activity that is not being done right, which is what? Safeguarding of stock in the store. Why are we saying that there is um, inadequate safeguarding of stock in the store? I need to explain to the lecturer why I'm saying that that statement is indicating that there is a weakness with regards to safeguarding of stock. And that's where I can state something like, as the door is always open. Oh, so when the lecturer reads my weakness statements, it makes sense to the lecturer that, okay, I'm saying that there is inadequate or poor safeguarding of stock in the storeroom simply because as provided in the study, uh, case study scenario, the door is always unlocked. You see that now? So this here is substantiating the fact that I've stated there concerning the control activity that is in it. Right? So it's substantiating why I'm saying there is inadequate safeguarding of stock in the store, simply because they are not keeping their door locked at all times. If I go to the next one, where we were saying that um, this, um, okay, maybe let me use the authorization, non-existing, uh, non-existence of authorization controls for credit sales. Why am, I, why am I saying that there's no authorization controls for credit sales? Because the cashier gives the customer goods on credit without the knowledge of the manager. Without the knowledge of the manager. So guys, what they want to see when you give a witness, they, they want to see, first of all, yes, that you have identified whether it's a missing control, or whether you are dealing with an inadequate control. Remember, don't forget this, guys. Missing control, meaning to say the control is not there at all in the organization. But if I say that uh, the, the, the control is not in existence in the organization, in how they are performing their day-to-day -day activities, I need to substantiate why I'm saying that control is not there. How do I substantiate it? Based off, of course, on the evidence that they've provided in the case study scenario. That's how I substantiate. The moment I, I, I substantiate my, my weakness statement, that way then it means it gives validity to the weakness statement that I've uh, given to the lecturer. That's how you get marks. So when they are saying identify your weakness, they, they, they really want you to make sure that you also substantiate why you're saying that, um, you know, that statement you're giving is a weakness in the organization, right? Same thing with inadequate controls. It's the same thing, guys. Same, same thing. I'm going to share these notes in the group so that you can you know, help you guys when you answer particularly question number one. But my focus for tonight is, is, is really centralized um, on the second question. And on the second question, uh, let's just go to the required part so that you can see what is going on. So guys, whenever you get an auditing question, whenever you get an auditing question, here is what you need to do at all times. Doesn't matter what it is that they are testing, but this is the formula. First of all, you always start off by reading and understanding the required part of the question, right? So that is always your point of departure. And I always call this step number one. So let's go through 2.1 and understand and analyze what exactly is the lecturer asking us to do here. So in 2.1, they ask you to compile audit risk applicable, audit risk what? Applicable to each of the above audit objectives, A to J. I repeat again, they want you to compile what? Audit risk applicable to each of the above audit objectives. So question of, the, the first question that should come into your mind is what, what is an audit objective? And what is an audit risk in this context? So those are the first two things that should come into your mind. And when you're asking yourself, what is an audit risk? 
or what is an audit objectives, because you can see there's an interrelationship between the two in any case. The moment you're asking yourself those questions, you are analyzing what I would call assumed knowledge, which the lecturer is testing. So whenever they are bringing any form of auditing question, they are literally testing your understanding. That's what I call assumed knowledge, understanding of the concept, right? So they are testing in this context, your understanding of the concept surrounding audit risks and in connection or in conjunction with audit objectives. So you cannot, in this context, uh, give an audit risk unless you first of all understand what an audit objective is, because that's what they've provided you. If you go through the case study scenario, these are what these are the audit objectives provided to us uh, in the in the system description or the case study scenario, right? So, but first of all, what is an audit objective, anyways? So that's the first question that you ask yourself. So, what is an audit objective? Okay. The second question is, what is an what is uh, what is an audit risk? What is an audit audit risk? So we're gonna answer all these questions. Don't worry. Before we can even analyze uh, the scenario itself, so you need to be able. So this is a point of departure because you cannot answer what you don't understand. It doesn't make logical sense. You need to have understanding of what exactly is. The lecturer expecting of you here and in 2.2 look at this they say compile one audit engagement procedure for each of the audit objectives from a to j so for each of the identified audit objectives given in the scenario you need to be able to come up with an engagement i mean an audit engagement procedure so that is the so the type of assumed knowledge in this context they are, which they are testing is is how to formulate engagement procedures audit engagement procedures and i'm going to show you what are all those things and how do you go about working on them so let's start off with the first required part before we go to the scenario what is an audit objective now guys an audit objective in simple terms it's always what the auditor intends achieve by performing or carrying out an engagement. I repeat, it's, it's simply, in simple, it simply refers to what the auditor intend or intends to achieve by performing or carrying out an audit engagement. So what is an audit engagement? An audit engagement is simply um, you know, an assurance service that is provided by the auditor to a client. That's what you call an engagement. So it can come in different forms of audits as in the context of internal. I'm in class, man. Right? So as internal auditors, guys, if you go to AUI, to AUI 2601, right? Uh, which is one of the second year modules. It, it, I can also just aid you guys to go through it. I, I'm gonna share the details on it. It gives you a background of the different types of audits that internal auditors perform. So we perform compliance audits. We perform things like operational audits, right? Financial audits, fraud audits as well. Or we, we actually help when it comes to fraud audits, but there are specific auditors that are you know, responsible for that type of audit. But we also carry out uh, that particular type of an audit as well, right? Right, okay, I'm, let me look at, there's something that was communicated on the chat. Absolutely, absolutely. You are definitely on the right on the right track. Absolutely on the right track, uh, Mr. Mr. Ron. Right. So, right. Coming back to an um, to the to the engagement uh, audit engagements here. So it comes in those forms, guys. So it can be assurance services or it can be consulting services. But you don't need to worry about that for now. But let me come back here. So it's. In this context, an audit objective is just simply what the auditor intends to achieve, um, you know, by carrying out an audit engagement. Question is, which audit engagement is he carrying out? Who has requested the audit engagement in the first place? It will be the client if we are working as 
you know, in, 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 in audit firm, or if you are working within the organization, it will be as a request from management. So those audit objectives, they have to link up with the audit, uh, with, with management objectives, right? Like what Mr. Ron is, is written in there, in the chat platform there. So your audit objectives, it always has to, 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 to link with what management intends to achieve with their day-to-day -day activities, which you are responsible for auditing at that particular point in time. So that's what an audit objective is, guys, in simple and plain English term. Then we go to an audit risk now. Now, audit risk, guys, um, it comes in different forms, but you, when you think of audit risks, uh, there are three types of audit risks, by the way. So it can be inherent risks. All right control risks, and what else? Objective risks, okay? That's what we call audit risks. They are classified into those three groups. But for this, uh, to make it easier for people to understand what is happening in this case, uh, in plain English, I don't wanna be complicated, I wanna be as simplified as possible for you guys. So when you're talking of a risk, you're thinking of things like, threats to the business, threats to the business, you're thinking of negative effects to the business, you're thinking of um, what could potentially go wrong, what could potentially go wrong. All right. In the organization, you're thinking of the impact, but from a negative perspective, negative impact to the business so operations. So that's that's what a risk is, guys. All right. So it can be anything that is a threat to the business, a negative effect to the business if they are not doing things right. It could be what could be what could potentially go wrong. All right in the organization, suppose they're not doing certain things right. So what is the danger? What are the dangers? What are the negative outcomes which that particular organization could suffer if they are not doing things properly, right? Those negative impacts. So it comes from different, from different angles. So um, if I'm looking at an audit objective, all right? If I'm looking at an audit objective, I need to think, okay, if ever they are not achieving this objective, right? What is the danger? So what is the risk surrounding failure to achieve that objective? Or what is that thing that may hinder the achievement of that set objective? That's exactly what your lecturer is asking for. So they are saying, okay, look, this is the management objective. Let me give an example with the first objective here. So let's say, for example, sales orders are properly prepared to quality description and customer details. So that is the objective. So management wants to ensure that all their sales orders, in other words, customer sales, right, orders are properly prepared, prepared, all right, to quality, description, and customer details. Now, if an order is properly prepared, reflecting the quality of items that have been ordered by the customer, the description of the items that have been ordered by the customer, and of course, the customer details. That means that order is considered to be a valid order. But the moment this quality, description, and customer details are not reflected there, it means we have got what? An invalid order. Does it make sense, colleagues? So the risk is the risk. The risk here is that there's a risk that sales orders um, may not be uh, may, may, may not be processed accurately here without a reflection of quality. Um, or it's actually, it's quality, not quantity. Sorry, quality description and the customer details. Actually, they wanted to say um, quantity there. It's, it's supposed to be quantity, not quality, by the way. So let me show you um, just, just a quick um, risk description that I've given. So for that, for that specific audit objective. So there's a risk that customer orders may not be processed accurately, resulting in what? Fictitious customer orders being generated 
for non-existing customers. Now, I want you to see what is happening there. Remember, the objective is that what? Um, all the orders should be what? Prepared, properly prepared. So if they are properly prepared, it means there is accuracy there. In terms of quality, but like I said, it's supposed to be quantity there. Description and customer details. So if they are not properly prepared, then obviously it means the order itself ultimately would be a fictitious order. Hence, I've given this statement over here as a risk description to say there's a risk that the customer order, customer sales order may not be processed accurately. So if the customer or sales order in this context is not processed accurately, what would be the resulting effect of that? There will be fictitious sales orders that will be generated for who? For non-existing customers. Because number one, the customer details will be invalid. So if the customer orders are, so the customer details are invalidated, it means the order itself, itself is actually invalidated. So that's where this risk is coming from. So question is, how does one process these things when they are looking just at the audit objective? So you look at what they want to achieve and you think of the negative side of it. That, that's just basically how you think of it. So the opposite, of the objective of the positive in this case. What would be the negative of the positive? That's exactly what they're asking for, which is the risk here. So if I want to make sure as a manager that all my sales orders are properly prepared as to quality description and customer details, it means these details should be reflected on the sales order, right? That is the positive that management wants to achieve. So, but let's flip the coin on the other side. If it's not being done that way, so what is that negative side of it? That's exactly what they want you to give. So that's why they are saying in this context of the question that compile the audit risk applicable to each of the audit objective. So your audit risk description has to directly link to the given audit objective as given in the scenario. So what am I doing here, colleagues? I'm trying to interpret for you what the examiner is or what the lecturer rather is requesting of you from the, from the required section of the, of the assignment question two here. That's exactly what I'm doing. But now let's begin to uh, go into details by looking now at, at the scenario just so that we can see what is happening here. So now we are told here in question two, during the preliminary review of the revenue uh, business cycle of TOPS, and, uh, and and limited a junior internal auditor identified the following critical audit objectives necessary to perform um, a financial audit of the revenue process. All right. The objective of the internal audit is to provide assurance that the revenue process operated in accordance with the company's policies and procedures during the financial year. Now, when I read something like this, okay? When I read something like this, guys, I would identify this just as background information. In other words, what the examiner is giving me here is details of what the organization is all about or what they are day-to-day -day activities really are and the type of service we are supposed to be providing to the client or to the organization in question. That's exactly what is happening in the first paragraph. So I don't identify this as a problem area, right? Now, what I would identify as problem areas, colleagues, um, to help everyone, a problem area in a case study scenario, that is always the area of value, which directly link with what they have required in the required part section of the question. That's what I call problem areas. So it's always that section in the case study scenario that when I read that information and I go back to my required, I can tell that there's something in that part or section in the, in the system description that helps me to answer the required section. That's exactly what I call problem areas. So in this case, um, in, in, in the first paragraph, I, I'm not seeing anything like that because the question is telling me that, look here, in required 2.1, compile audit risks applicable to each of the above audit objectives. So yes, I'm gonna formulate or give audit risk descriptions, but it has to be based off on the audit objectives that they've given me from A to J. So if I'm looking at the first paragraph, there's nothing about A to J that they've mentioned there, except when I begin to read from this point 
going down. So that's why I'm simply saying that here, all I'm seeing is just background information and that's it, right? So let's continue. So, but before we continue, I want you guys to analyze the question and understand what is happening in the scenario. It's very important to be able to interpret what you have been given in the case study. So guys, number one, if I'm looking at this particular organization, Tops and Ends Limited, do you, do, you, do, you, do you agree with me that first of all, that is a public company? It's a public company. And uh, from what I'm noticing, it's a public company that is performing or executing what I call revenue and receipt cycle. That's number one. From the background information, I am seeing a public uh, company that is actually affecting a revenue and receipt cycle, in all the, which is literally what I would call their day-to-day -day activity. So they are selling a finished product to their end users. That is what their primary business activities is all about. So it's all about generating revenue by selling a finished product to their end user or to their customer. That's exactly what is happening in the first paragraph. Right. And then the second thing I'm also seeing there, because I need, you need to be able to interpret these things, guys. Right. And then the second thing you can tell is we are told that, um, uh, okay. Now, a junior internal auditor identified the following critical audit objectives necessary to perform the audit of the revenue of the revenue process. Okay, great. So there's something that has been identified here. So I'll just simply call these ones findings. And the findings that they've already picked up, which they are telling me that this is what I'm going to find as I read through the case study, it has to do with those audit objectives, guys. And these audit objectives, already I know that they are, this audit objective, they have to do with the revenue and receipt cycle. Remember, that's very important to understand the type of a business cycle you're dealing with. And it becomes easier even to also begin to think of things like risks and stuff like that, because you already know what type of cycle you're dealing with, right? Then the third thing that I can also pick up still from the background information is the fact that, okay, we want to assess. So this is what the auditors want to assess. The objective of the internal audit is to what? To provide assurance that the revenue process operated in accordance with the company's policies and procedures during the current financial year. So guess what? The type of assurance service, the type of assurance service in this context, guys, is very simple. It's compliance audit. It's a compliance audit. That's exactly what is going on. Because we want, what, what the internal audit they're simply assessing is assessing whether the, uh, the revenue process operated in accordance. So in other words, they're saying whether it was done in compliance with the company policies and procedures during the current financial year. So that's a compliance audit <coughs> that is going on right there. So that's what I can pick up, guys, from the background information. But I'm not done. Then I continue reading, right? I continue reading because remember, I'm looking for the areas of value in the scenario to address the required. Then we are told the critical audit objectives are to determine that. So now what are they telling me? They're now telling me these findings now. And those findings, A, all the way to J, that's exactly where the areas of value are in the scenarios to help me to address my required part, both 2.1 and 2.2. So let's go through each one of them individually so that we can you know, see what is happening there. So the first point we are told in point A, sales orders are properly prepared as to quality, description, and customer details. All right? So if I'm looking at this, I'm looking at revenue and receipt cycle, I must be able to pick, okay, so which of the functions in the revenue and receipt cycle does this relate to, right? If I can identify the function in which this particular audit objective relate to, guess what? It becomes easier for me to be able to also determine the type of risks we are dealing with. So here's my approach, by the way, when I was doing the assignment, there are two sources of materials that I'm going to recommend you guys to also go back to. You can do this even in your own time. There are two sources. What is your orange textbook, which is performance of internal audit engagement textbook, which is this orange textbook in color. The other one that you can use, uh, it's called audit notes, and I'm going to show you 
how you're gonna navigate around it. So I'm gonna illustrate perhaps with, um, with the audit notes. I'm gonna illustrate, sorry, with the audit notes shortly. And uh, if I'm looking at the audit notes, chapter 10 deals with the revenue and receipt cycle, all right? And then if I'm going into your, pre this is your prescribed textbook, by the way, performing internal audit engagements, that's your prescribed textbook by your lecturers, right? Um, I'm gonna show you what topic that deals with, this aspect here real quick. Because the ideology is to show you how you can do these things even on your own. I want you guys to be as independent as possible because in the exam, you'll be alone, right? So if I look at my top, the topics in the, in the actual prescribed textbook, it's, it's, it's chapter three, revenue and receipt cycle. So what is it that you're looking for from, from, from this particular topic? All you want to do is to get the blueprint, guys, of the functions in the revenue and receipt cycle. So in other words, what is it that is supposed to be happening for example, if it's ordering, all right, processing of customer orders, for example, which is basically ordering, what exactly is it that should take place when orders are being taken, right? So that's where then it becomes easier as well to even think of things like what could potentially go wrong. In other words, those risks um, which they are requir requesting of you guys to do there. So now let me take you through chapter 10, uh, just to illustrate from the audit notes, right? Uh, it, I think it will be much easier from there. Right. So, for example, if I'm looking at the context of our question in the assignment, uh, where is that question? Oh, sorry. So, if I'm looking at this first audit objective that we're given, sales orders are properly prepared as to quality, description, and customer uh, customer details. The moment I'm seeing a sales order, guys, if I go into the 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 the, the, the revenue receipt cycle, I'm dealing with receiving customer orders. Do you agree with me there? I need your interaction. Do you guys agree with me there? Yes or no? That audit objective, it relates to this function, receiving customer orders. So in other words, that's ordering. So even if you go through your prescribed study material, I'm gonna try and maybe show it to you so that you guys can actually see this for yourselves. I think it's important that you do see this. So this is revenue and receipt cycle. I just want to show you those functions anyways. I have notes on this as well, uh, which I can share. Look at this. So these are the functions. In other words, stages that you perform when you're carrying out a revenue and receipt cycle. So there's receiving and processing customer orders. So it's the same function that I'm, I'm, I'm trying to show you, but from a different source material, which is audit notes in this context. So it's the same thing here. So what I want you to notice is this. When you are processing or receiving customer orders, right? The audit object, the objective of this function is to record orders from customers and to initiate action to fill them. All right. I'm not going to mention a whole lot of things that are that is written here, but the most the first point it already summarizes what you know order department should be doing. So they are supposed to record orders from customers and to initiate action to fill them. But all these should be happening accurately. All right, and there should be an indication of the description, quantity, delivery address, which is the customer details. So the delivery address is just cognizant, it's just indicating the fact that there has to be a customer detail on the order. And then the quantity has to be reflected. How many items is this person buying? The description of the goods that are being bought, they have to be indicated. That's why I'm saying to you that if I'm looking at um, this objective here, it's not supposed to be as to quality. It has to be quantity here because we are still ordering. So uh, the quantity has to be, I mean, it has to be reflected in the sales order. Quality, we'll talk about it when we receive the actual product. That's when we talk of quality, not quantity. Okay. So, yeah, I hope you take note of that. So, what I want you to study, or what I want you to observe is this. So, you are looking at what is happening during the ordering function. These are the documents they'll use customer orders, internal sales orders. And by the way, the internal sales order, that's exactly what they are talking about, which is reflecting things like uh, the quantity, the description, and of course, the, the customer details. But the danger now is orders may be accepted from a non-account holder. Orders may, orders may not be acted upon timelessly or at all, resulting in a loss of sales and customer goodwill. And uh, the one which is more relevant to what we are given 
inaccurate or incomplete order details may be recorded, which will result in incorrect deliveries, returns, and customer dissatisfaction. Now, if I take this risk description here, the risk that they, they may be inaccurate or incomplete order details, filled on the sales order or recorded, which would result in inaccurate or incorrect deliveries, returns and customer dissatisfaction rather, then, and I look at the audit objective, uh, sorry, audit objective, where is it? Audit objective here, I can quite frankly see that this particular risk description that is given in the prescribed material, it tally with what is given here. Okay, there's one of the things I need to close because now it's confusing. Um, there's just too many things I need to close now, right? It's much better like this. It tallies with the audit objective that I've been given here. Why? So what is it that I, I'm do, what you what you are supposed to do? You look at the audit objective and you identify the function in the revenue and receipt cycle which this particular audit objective relates to. It becomes easier to think of the risk. Some of them are risks, by the way, they are literally given to you in your prescribed material right in front of you. Some of them, you can simply think them out of the box. That's what I did with some of them, but I'm just trying to also help, you know, as you go about doing this thing on your own, how do you go about doing it? So let's look at the second one. All the sales orders are recorded after delivery. So that is the objective to ensure that all the sales orders are recorded after delivery. So the question is, if I'm looking at the objective that they've given me here, which of the stages in the revenue and receipts cycle does it relate to? So let's look here. Does it deal with receiving and processing customer orders, granting credit to customers, shipping the product to the relevant location or delivering the service, invoicing the customer and recording the sale? collecting payments from customers, processing goods returns, write off bad debts, as well as providing for credit losses or doubtful debts. So if I'm looking at these stages, guys, which of the stage would you say, I think the audit objective that they've given in the assignment, um, that they've given in this assignment, so I'm looking at number B, all the sales orders are recorded after delivery. So if I go into my revenue and receipt cycle, which function here relates to that audit objective? Where is the recording of sales taking place in any of these given functions, guys? That's a question I'm asking. Looks like the others have been affected by load shading. That's why they disconnected, I see. Uh, That's why they are disconnected, but it's okay. But okay, so quite frankly, what I can tell you from there is the fact that number four, uh, which is the fourth function in the revenue and receipt cycle is actually what relates to that audit objective, because look at this recording the sale invoicing the customer and what else recording the sale so it's it's actually stage number four in the revenue and receipt cycle which tally with this audit objective because notice what is happening all the sales orders they are what recorded after delivery so if i go back again to my textbook and i'm looking at the revenue and receipt cycle delivery takes place at stage number four number three sorry De that's where the delivery of the products or the service is taking place. After that has done has taken place, then I see a recording of the sale taking place in the next stage. So if I go to number four, all right, let me illustrate this time with your prescribed textbooks to show you the risks there. So in uh, number four, that would be section B. I'm gonna show it to you shortly. I really want you to see this. Um, I'm looking for section B. Uh, should be able to see it shortly. Please bear with me on this one because it can be a bit slower because I'm navigating in a soft copy. Uh, yes, so this is section B, right? So within section B, 
what you're simply going to do is you're going to look for the fourth function in the revenue and receipt cycle. And that's what we're going to do. So it has to do with recording of the sale. So I'm going to show it to you now. Right. So, so the first one is, okay, the second, this is the second one, granting of credit. So that's not what we're looking for. Uh, placing of order, that's not what we're looking for. So we skip that. Processing of orders received from customers. No, that's not what we're looking for. Dispatching of products, which is delivery. That's not what we're looking for. We're looking for something that happens after that. Not get control either. All right, invoicing of customers. This is more or less uh, what we are looking for. Right. But it tallies anyways with this part, recording of sales in the accounting record. That's exactly what we are looking for. So it's stage number four, remember, in the revenue and receipt cycle. So guess what is happening in your prescribed take, uh, study material? They give you the risks that may okay, okay, that may okay within that stage of recording of sales. And they also give you the, the probable internal control activity as well. Perfect. I'm, I'm, I'm happy, Mr. Ron, that you can actually see this. I'm, I'm really glad that you can. So now look at this. So there are different risks that you've been given. Sales transactions missing from accounting records. So how do you deal with this? Sequential pre-numbering of all documents should happen. Sales transaction missing from account. So this is now if you're using a computer or a computerized system. And this, 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 they are giving you in this in the first column uh, risks and internal controls where it's a manual system. So in other words, there's no computer involvement. But if you are using a computer, a computerized system, they also give you the same thing, uh, the risk that could happen in that environment and the control, the relevant control as well, right? So look at this, sales transactions recorded inaccurately in accounting records, okay. Uh, same thing can happen even in a computerized environment. That's it. So now, if I'm looking back at our at our at our audit objective, so the audit objective is simple. All the sales orders are what recorded after the delivery. So if I'm thinking at if I'm looking at the objective uh, apart just from looking at the the state in the cycle. Remember that's why I told you I do not just only rely at looking at the, the function is given in the textbook. Some of the things I had to use my head to think and process these things by just looking at what I've been given in the scenario. So if I'm looking at all the sales orders are recorded after the delivery, the danger is that there could be a risk that not all the sales are recorded after delivery to the customer. So there's a risk that there may be incomplete sales records although goods have been delivered to a customer, all right? I'm just trying to explain the risks that I've, uh, that I've given in the assignment, but if I'm to be more precise, so there's a risk that a sales record or sales records may not be captured and maintained for goods delivered to a customer. That is the risk there. So yes, you have delivered the goods to the customer, but there's no transaction to actually support that such an activity really took place. So that is the risk. But the objective is to make sure that all those sales are recorded after the deliveries to the customer is actually transpired. Then we go to the next one. All the sales orders are not delivered. So all sales orders not delivered are followed up after 20 days, after the initial order date. So what could be the risk there? So the risk is that there may be no follow up of sales orders that are not filled up after the 20 day period is elapsed from initial order date. So that is the risk that you could have given there, that there is no follow ups done, right? So if, I, if you look at the actual description that I've given is that there's a risk that no follow ups done for goods not delivered after 20 days from the initial order date. So the risk in actual fact is just no following up, right? So it's pretty simple pretty straightforward. Then you go to the next one, number G, the prices and terms of all the sales orders comply with the relevant company policy. So the risk is simple, that uh, there's a risk that the prices and terms of a sales order may not be compliant with the relevant sales policy. 
because anything in this context, the, the specific company policy you are dealing with is a sales policy. So there is a risk of non-compliance. So if you look at my risk description, there it is, that there could be incorrect prices and terms communicated, resulting in inaccurate sales orders. All this, so that's one way. So obviously, if you're not compliant with the prices and the terms, then that means there'll be incorrect pricings uh, being quoted, incorrect terms being quoted to a customer on the sales order. So if, 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 if there's incorrect pricing, incorrect terms being uh, <clears throat> you know, reached with the customer, outside of the company policy, it means there's no, that's not compliant, in other words. So you could have put it that way, the way exactly I did, or you could have simply said, there's, there's non there, there may be non-compliance with the company's sales policy in terms of pricing and terms on the sales order. That, that's another way. <clears throat> Let me see, uh, answer more than one engagement procedure. Each. Yes, you, you can. Yes, you can. Actually, it gives you a high probability of getting all the marks for the given question. So the more procedures you give, well, the high probability you can actually get in terms of marks. So you're not limited to just giving one procedure because there are different ways in which auditors can, you know, collect um, audit evidence. So you, you can do it through walkthrough tests, can do it through inspections, can happen through inquiry. But at the end of the day, the ultimate thing is to say, we want to have evidence in our hands, right? So yes, you can actually give more than one audit procedure for each of the given audit objectives. And then let's go to the next one. Sales orders <clears throat> are only prepared for customers who pass the credit check. Notice sales orders are only what? Prepared for customers who pass the credit check. So in other words, they're saying they are only processing sales orders for as long as a customer is credit worthy. That's exactly what they are saying. So the risk is that a sales order may be processed for customers who are not credit worthy or for customers who do not pass the credit check of the organization. That's it. That's, that's the risk here. So if I'm to show you how I uh, documented it. So there's a risk of granting credit to uncredited worthy customers. And so that, that's still the same thing, just writing it in different, in different words or in different wording, so to speak. But you can simply also say that there's a risk that a sales order may be initiated for customers who are not able to pay the organization or to customers who may not have qualified the, 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 the credit check test. Full stop. So that's another way you can change um this particular risk description that i've given right and then you go to the next one goods may only leave the premises <clears throat> on oh what you're not giving is uh it's it's more of an audit procedure but i'm, I'm still dealing with the with the audit audit risks for now <laughs> So the audit procedure, it will be 2.2, yeah. <laughs> but I can see what you're giving me now. When you're saying compare uh, the customer details with the credit, uh, credit check approved customer list. Uh, that, that's more, that, that's sounding more like an audit procedure, but it's incomplete that procedure that you've given me. Because then one of the things that your lecturer would check would be to say, uh, okay, yes, you're comparing the customer details with the credit check approved customer list, um why are you doing that so that, that is what is missing in that procedure because there are three things that they look for when, when they are marking an uh an audit procedure they're looking for how the what and the why in your statement so they in this context if i'm to break down your procedure uh if i was marking it as your lecturer i would have said okay i see compare so i give you one and a half mark for for simply saying compare what are you comparing? You're comparing the customer details with a credit check approved customer list. Okay, great. I give you another half a mark for giving me the source of evidence, which is the what. Then I'll be now looking for one last thing now, which is the why element. If that why element is missing in your audit procedure, guess what happens? You forfeit even the other half a mark that you would have obtained. So you lose half a mark for saying compare, you'd lose half a mark for saying customer details of the credit check. For as long as you omit the Y part, the procedure will be incomplete and you get zero. They are very, 
very strict when they are marking audit procedures. Please take note of that. Right. But now let's let's continue so that we can we can finish off on the on the on the on the audit risks now. Right. So if I look at um, number F, we are told goods may only leave the premises if accompanied by an approved order. So what is the risk there? So there's a risk that goods may actually be delivered to customers without um, supporting uh, sales orders, right? So in other words, that's, that, that's theft right there. So the risk is theft of, 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 of um, inventory goods. But let me also give you the way I've uh, explained it here. So that there's a risk of an authorized dispatch of inventory items resulting in possible theft of inventory goods. There's a risk of an authorized dispatch of inventory items, okay, resulting in possible theft of inventory goods. So what is it that is making the dispatch to be unauthorized? Because it doesn't have supporting documents in form of the sales order. Or I can simply say inaccurate dispatch of inventory items resulting in inventory shortages. Because obviously if there's no sales order, all right, that, that, that is there to substantiate that, okay, the goods that have been dispatched, they were indeed goods that were ordered by the customers. Definitely we're gonna have shortages in inventory because there's no, account, there's no money to account for the sale that the company have received in that case, right? So that would be the risk in this, in this case. Okay, let me see what you've said. Uh, when you say lack, lacking of documentation and records, now that would be now a weakness because remember, you're saying there's a control that is lacking or that is missing. And in that case, you're saying it's actually documentation and records. But which documentations and records are you referring to? Um, I think what I need to do, <clears throat> I think it can help uh, both yourself and even the other colleagues. There is a massive difference between a weakness and a risk. So maybe just so that I can help you and the others, let me, let me put it this way so that it becomes way much easier for you to follow, right? Uh, just one moment. Okay, just one moment. I'm adjusting the class for now, but I'll do it afterwards. Uh, okay, so let me explain the differences. So if you are talking, so here's what happens. A weakness is always something that happens first. So when you're talking of weaknesses, uh, the other word, interchange of terminology to a weakness, it's called the red flag. Another interchange of terminology to a weakness is, 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 um, a risk indicator, a risk. Notice there's a difference between a risk indicator and the actual risk. A risk indicator is something that shows me that, okay, there's danger there, but it's not the actual danger. It's just something that shows that, okay, there's probability of danger occurring, but the actual danger has not necessarily happened, right? Then on the one hand, so on the other hand, we have what we call a risk, right? So I'm going to distinguish between the two so you can see the differences. So when you talk of a weakness, it's, it can be anything like a red flag or just a risk indicator, something that reflects that something is just not being done right. So in simple English, it's just a reflection that something is not being done right or correctly in simple English, right? I always wanna keep things very simple for, people, for students to understand. And then how do I know that something is not being done right or it's not being done correctly? There are two ways, two ways to identify that. Two ways to identify that. It can come either as a condition where the um, uh, inadequate controls And usually when you deal with adequate controls, these are existing controls 
that are not being affected or rather than not being um, performed correctly. And if they are not being performed correctly, it means they will be ineffective, right? They'll be ineffective. So in simple terms, these are ineffective controls. That's what we call inadequate controls. It's just controls that are not being uh, performed correctly. In other words, they're ineffective. They're not achieving the purpose as to why they are in existence in the first place. So that's inadequate controls. And another way that we identify a weakness is basically in a condition where they are missing control. So these are controls that are not in place. In other words, these are lacking controls. Very, very important to take note of this. Right. So that's what a weakness is all about. So it's all about, you know, we're looking at a condition in the organization and we assess to say, are they doing these things correctly? Are they doing things right? If they're not doing things correctly, they're not doing things right. Question is, okay, the condition I'm looking at in the organization, is it reflecting it to me as, um, you know, an inadequate control? Or is it reflecting to me as a missing control? Now, if it's an inadequate control, or if it's a missing control, what can the organization suffer because of that condition? That's where a risk comes in. So if we have this condition, if we have these red flags, we have these risk indicators, right? Pointers that are telling us that, okay, look here, things are not happening right here in this organization. Things are just not being done correctly then what could be the harm that the organization would suffer? So that's where a risk comes in. And I'll call this undesired consequences, undesired consequences, or what I'll call undesired outcomes, right? These are things that I would call what could go wrong, right? So if you're not doing things correctly, what could go wrong then? And what could go wrong, it has to be something negative to the business, something that would affect the business badly. It can be in form of a negative impact. What is the impact to the business, but from a negative point of view? What could be the threat to the business from the negative point of view? What is it that is going to affect the business in a negative way? That's what the risk is. But we cannot have the undesired consequences then the negative impact, the threats to the business, unless there were pointers somehow, somewhere in the way we are carrying out our day-to-day -day activities that showed us that, okay, look here, you're not doing this thing right. And the more you continue doing this thing inaccurately or incorrectly, then here you're opening your door, like you're opening room for danger, right? So the moment we are identifying a condition like that, it means we have a weakness. So that weakness, weakness is just an indication that, okay, something is not done right. And for as long as that condition remains like that and management don't take corrective measures to address the, the, the pre-existing weaknesses in the, in, the, in the system description, then you would definitely open yourself to danger. And the moment you talk of danger, that's a risk. And it's always what comes after a weakness has not been addressed. So that's danger in simple terms. I hope this... Uh, summarizes the difference because I know sometimes students can confuse the two, by the way. So I thought, let me explain the differences between a weakness and a risk. So that is the difference right there. Right. I, I, I don't know if it's, it's, it's clear to you, my brother. So you can just indicate in the chat there if, 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 it's, if it's clear to you. Right. So what you stated in the chat when you're saying lack uh, lacking of, uh, what is it, documentation and records, lacking of documentation and records, you're saying to us that there is a missing control, which has to do with documentation and record keeping within the organization. So guess what is that? That's a weakness. So if there's no, or, I mean, if there's lack of documentation and records, what would be the danger now that the company will suffer? And that's what a risk is. And that's what they are looking for in 2.1, right? So great. So now we continue and then we are looking at, uh, okay, we did address F, which had to do with the uh, goods may not leave the, uh, sorry, goods may only leave the premises if accompanied by an approved order. So guess what is the risk? 
If they don't have proper control measures, the risk is this. The risk of unauthorized dispatch of inventory items resulting in possible theft of inventory goods. For as long as the dispatch is not authorized, it means there is no supporting documents in form of an approved order. So if there's no approved order, guess what? That for as long as they tell you on record that they've dispatched X amount of goods, but there's no supporting documents in form of an authorized order, it means that dispatch was unauthorized. So that is the risk there. So the risk that unauthorized dispatch of inventory goods or items may occur, which would result in possible inventory shortages or probable theft of inventory. Right, so that's number F. Then we go to number G. Goods are only assembled for delivery once in, uh, the approved order is received. Okay, so that's what uh, I've noticed with, um, you know, you think of, um, especially the car manufacturing industry, the, the likes of, uh, I'm not going to mention uh, names here for confidentiality sake, but there are certain companies in the manufacturing of vehicles fraternity that only actually assemble cars for as long as they've received the order for that. Okay. One of those uh, companies that I'm talking about is from Germany. So you can take a wide guess and you can do a research on it. But <clears throat> yeah, so you look at this, it's a control measure, by the way, that they are deploying to say, look, we can only assemble this type of a vehicle for as long as we have received an X amount of orders from, from the market. So that's that's a control measure in this case. Um, so, goods, so what is the risk then? If you're only assembling goods, so management is saying we can only assemble, all right, goods for delivery if there is an approved order that has been received. So the risk is that they may assemble goods, all right, without an approved order, which could result in increased storage costs that could affect the organization financially. And let me just give you exactly the way I've given that risk description. So there's the risk um, of manufacturing unnecessary goods, all right, without any order request resulting in financial losses caused by the increased storage costs to the company. Because if you manufacture goods, all right, that are just going to stay in your warehouse and there's no one that is ordered um, to purchase them. Then obviously, um, one of the things that's going to happen is your storage cost is going to be high. Think of an organization that is renting out a warehouse property and not owning one. So definitely that, that is a probable risk to, to that audit objective. Right. And then we've got H, invoices are prepared in the same numeric sequence uh, as the order after the delivery of the order. I saw something similar to this as we're scrolling. Uh, through, I believe it was here. So I'm going to show it to you now. Here it is. Here's the risk. Sales transactions missing from accounting records. That is the risk. And look at the control to address that. Sequential pre-numbering of all documents. Sequential pre-numbering of all documents. So in other words, they need to have a corresponding sequencing uh, in order. So this is the risk you could have taken exactly the way it is, that the risk that sales transactions may be may, may go missing from the accounting records. So that's why they are making sure that, um, uh, what is it? Invoices that are prepared in the same sequ numeric sequence as the order after the delivery of the, or of the order. So they wanna make sure that your sales transaction will be valid. It will be accurate. So the way we can prove that the sales order is accurate is if we have got the corresponding supporting documents in form of the invoice itself and the initial order document that was, um, you know, uh, I mean, that was generated from the beginning of the transaction, right? So, but let me show you also how I've indicated it from here. Number I, the risk that goods sold to customers may not be invoiced at all. So that's another risk I'm giving now. And notice this risk I've given um, <laughs> completely opposite to this. So you could have also taken this to say there's a risk that sales transactions may, may go missing in the accounting records of the organization, right? So that's another way. So this is another risk I'm giving you over and above what I've already given here. 
right? And then we look at number J. Number J says the accounting system prepares an edge analysis of all the accounts payable balances on the date the data statements are printed uh, for review by the data administrator. Okay, the moment I think of an edge analysis, I'm thinking about ensuring that, look, we maintain an accurate record in terms of the account balances of our debtors. That's what the age analysis is all about. So you wanna make sure you maintain a, an accurate record of the account balance of a data in terms of how long they are owing you, be it 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, et cetera, right? So that's the purpose of an age analysis. It's all about ensuring this accuracy in terms of your, uh, in terms of your data's management. So if I'm looking at this from the revenue and receipt perspective, it's the next function that actually deals with that, which is data's data's control it's not about invalid discount uh, you know granted here but definitely the first one yes it makes sense to say the risk that data ledger shows incorrect and or long outstanding balances that is the risk right there the data ledger shows incorrect and or long outstanding balances if you don't maintain or you don't compare your edge analysis to the data statements you've generated then you are likely going to miss it as far as maintaining accurate uh, data account balances is concerned so you definitely miss it there. so that is why things like regular edge analysis of data must be prepared can you see it there the monthly data statements must be prepared all these things they are prepared and they are reconciled in other words they agree that the edge analysis the data statements uh, that are distributed to the data in order to ensure they detail the risk that data ledgers would reflect incorrect and or long outstanding uh, balances for uh, for the data of course right so it's 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 it's, it's really right straight in front of you and this is the function in the revenue and receipt cycle that we're dealing with, data control. So that's how you could have obtained that one. So look at the risk that I've given, the risk that the data ledger may reflect incorrect or long outstanding balances. And then you are done with question three, uh, 2.1 from A to J. So these are probable audit risks. I'm not saying this is everything guys, but you can also think of others beyond what I've just given you. This is just as a guide and it's very relevant to the question that has been given to you. Then let's have a look at the next question, really brief. Now, this is now where we are addressing audit engagement procedures. I'm going to open notes, I think, before I explain about this uh, part of the question so that you can gain value on that. Um, just one moment. I don't want to keep the session too long. I'm going to try my level best to be as fast as possible. Right. So when you're talking of audit procedures, right, there are two types of audit procedures. Um, yeah, <laughs> so I'm going to be very brief, very brief. The, mo the only thing I just wanted to show you when you're dealing with audit procedures is they are looking for three things, which is your how, your what, and your why in the statement that you give when you're formulating a procedure. So make sure, I think the most important thing I'll just say uh, that you need to make sure you do is reflect the how, the what, and the why in the statement description you give. So I'm going to illustrate here. Notice, look at this. Um, just look at this um, procedure, okay? Because I told you they give one and a half mark per procedure. So here is, this is how they do it. So look at this procedure. Inspect that invoices are numbered in sequence to confirm that all sales transactions are recorded so they are when they're giving marks here's what they are doing they're checking okay have you given them the how they give you half a mark for indicating the how so this is how they mark so they give you half a mark for that okay then the next thing they're going to look for is the what and the what in this case is the sequence of invoices the sequence of invoices so technically this it is all this part over here, they give you another half a mark for indicating that. For as long as you omit the Y part, which is to confirm that all sales transactions are recorded, guess what happens? You lose all the marks. But if you give them the Y part as well, guess what? You get the full mark, which is 1,5. For each of the procedures you're going to give, 
So if you give them maybe two procedure for from each of those audit objectives, ah, it optimizes your chances of getting full marks for that particular question, right? So that is the whole ideology behind this. I'm, I'm not gonna really take uh, too much explanation on this, but pretty much that's what you, you guys are supposed to do for the second assignment. So if you are looking at this audit objective, what you need to think of is just the source of evidence that you are dealing with. So if I'm looking at sales orders are properly prepared as to quality, quantity, description, and customer details, guess what? That's a document. So if I'm looking at the source, source of evidence as a document, what do I do when I get documents in my hands? I inspect the documents. That's why you can see my first procedure here is inspection. So what am I gonna do? I'm gonna inspect a sample of sales orders for quality, actually it's supposed to be quantity, description, and customer details to what? to ensure they are clearly defined on each sales order. So look at this now. I want you to observe my procedures. Inspect, I get a half a mark for, for, for giving them the how. What am I inspecting? I'm inspecting sales orders. I get another half a mark for that. Why am I inspecting them to see or to determine or to ensure that they are clearly defined for on each sales order? I get another half a mark. That's, that's one and a half mark that I'm getting for this particular procedure. You go to the next procedure, uh, inspect the sales records for the attached copies of delivery notes and accompanying goods received notes to ensure that all the deliveries made for customer sales are accurately recorded with the company supporting documentation. So what is happening there? For saying inspect, I'm getting half a mark. Why? Because I've indicated the how. What is it that I am inspecting? I'm inspecting the sales records together with their accompanying supporting documents in form of delivery notes and the goods received notes. That's another half a mark because I've indicated the what. Why am I inspecting these things? To ensure that all the deliveries made for customer sales are accurately recorded with company, accompanying supporting documentation. So guys, you can do the same for all the other audit objectives that you've been given, right? So I don't have to necessarily take you through the entire thing, but this is something you can, you know, you can assess for the rest of, of those audit procedures. The most important thing was to make sure you have at least some light guidelines on how to, you know, and, uh, uh, approach the assignment. So I think at this point, we have come to the end of our discussion and I am ready to take any questions if you have got any questions, sir before we can uh, bring the session to a close. You can just even type it on the, on the, on the chat if, if you've got any questions, you're more than welcome to do that. Let's see. Okay, right, right. So the, 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 all right, so let me explain the differences. I think I'll take you back to my notes. That's why I think it was important for me to have taken you thoroughly on this because it, it will give you light. So you see, it's important to understand what the how represents, what the what represents, and what the why represents. So when you're talking of the how, in simple terms, it's what I call action words. And this describes the action that the auditor needs to perform. In other words, how is the auditor going to collect the evidence? Is it going to be by inspection, observation, recalculations, inquiry, tracing, vouching, recalculating, reperforming, reviewing, comparing, agreeing, or whatever, right? That's always the action verb, and that is what represents the how. Then when you talk of the what, the what part is always the source of evidence, which can be either documentary or physical in nature. When I'm saying documentary, it, it, I mean, it can be any type of document, you name it. It can be um, a delivery note, it can be an, a, a copy of a customer order, it can be uh, anything like an invoice, text invoice, right? Receipts, bank statements, um, a, 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 the, the data ledgers, et cetera, and et cetera. All these things that are documentary in nature, that's what we call documentary evidence. Then we've got physical evidence and physical evidence, it can come as either physical assets, right? Of the organization, normally what we call property planning equipment assets, machinery, uh, computer equipment, uh, vehicles, land and buildings, 
cranes and all that. That's what we call physical assets or even normal stock in the warehouse. That's what we call physical evidence. And also to, it would include um, you know, people, right? Because the person will definitely, I mean, interact with the person physically. So it's still also part of physical evidence because you can see a person physically, right? So, and, and, and another source of evidence is the actual procedure. And that's what we mean when you're saying the action being performed. So now that is the third thing or the third source of evidence, which is there. I would call this one the process activity. So by li literally observing the process activity or by observing the actions that are being performed within a particular uh, division of the organization, I I'll be able to collect evidence that way. So I need to know if I'm dealing with documents, what, what are those action verbs? In other words, the, 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 the how, how is it supposed to be formulated? If I'm dealing with documents, normally I inspect. I can either compare certain details on the documents. If I don't want to inspect, I can simply compare the, the, the two documents. If maybe um, I'm dealing, let's say, with inventory account balance, I can I can compare the account balance in the current, the opening balance in the current um, ledger for the year against the closing balance in the financial statements or in the trial balance for the previous financial year. That way I can be able to correlate whether the opening balance is accurate or is complete, right? So that, that, that's with the documents. With, with, with physical evidence, normally you also inspect the physical evidence, right? You might inspect the assets or inspect the inventories to confirm whether they are damages or whether they are matching with the quality standards. Or if you don't want to inspect the physical evidence, one of the things you can also do is um, you know, to, to, to compare or you match the, what they've stated in their documents with the actual thing that is physically evident, right? And with the process activity, one of the best ways that when you want to, you know, to audit a specific activity that is done on a day-to-day -day basis, you, you perform walkthrough tests or you can simply do an observation of what they're doing. That's with the type of evidence process activity right there. So then the why part, my brother, is always the reason why you are performing the test of control. In other words, why are you trying to collect evidence? What do you want to achieve? And that's what the audit objective is. And that's what you were given over here in the assignment, right? To ensure that all the sales orders are properly prepared as to quantity, description, and customer details. That is what management's objective. So your audit objectives as an auditor, they must agree with management, management objectives. Because at the end of the day, why they want you to audit certain things is because they want to make sure that their objectives are achieved at the end of the day, right? I don't know if that answered your question, sir. You, you can. Ah, perfect, perfect. I don't know if there's anything else. If you've got any other question, please, more than welcome to ask. All right, perfect. I'll definitely share the link, 100%. All right, thank you so much. Thank you so much. We will tune in on the other sessions all together. Thank you. All right.